What's cracking guys, in this video I'm covering audio clip, extending clip to image, text and audio by Andrei Guzov, Federico Rao, Jun Hees and Andreas Dengel from DFKI and Technical University of Kaiserlautern. So what they do, the main idea they, they do in this, in this paper is they uh, extend clip uh, by adding a novel modality and that's audio. And so before even st I start digging into this paper, I thought explaining how OpenAI's open clip model works. And for those of you who want to know all of the nitty gritty details of the paper, you can check out my video on clip. I've uh, made it a couple of months ago. And yeah, uh, so having said that, um, the main motivation be behind clip was uh, to to try and, and see how uh, vision models perform given a huge amount of data, so scale. And as we already know, uh, OpenAI um, did the same thing in NLP with GPT family of models, especially the GPT-3 uh, model, which was huge, like 175 billion uh, parameter model. And uh, the thing is, in vision, in computer vision, until recently, we were using stuff like ImageNet or ImageNet 21K, which were super small compared to the NLP. NLP standards. Uh, so obviously, okay, Google had uh, their own proprietary big data set, uh, JFT 300M, I think, and but that's not obviously uh, public. And so OpenAI had to create their own data set, and they finally ended up with a 400 million uh, image caption pairs, which they've used to train this clip model. We're just gonna that we are about to explore. Uh, so, um, again, uh, one more thing is that they wanted to see how the natural language works as the, as the source of supervision compared to those gold labels you have on your classical image, uh, like uh, ImageNet data set, for example, or whatever arbitrary uh, vision data set like Cypher 10 or whatnot. Um, okay, having said that, let me kind of briefly recap how Clip works. So, how you train Clip is the following. You have a batch of images, you have a batch of corresponding uh, captions, and you encode those into these uh, like uh, representations here. And what you do then is you basically apply cosine similarity between uh, all of the pairs. And you want to make sure you, you maximize the corresponding image and captions. So I1 corresponds to T1. That's why we want to maximize this particular term. But we want to minimize all of the other ones. And the same goes for the other elements on this main diag diagonal. And so again, you want to maximize those and you want to minimize all of the other ones. So going in a bit more detail here, ImageNet, so what they, what, what they, um, what they've used for the image encoder was the vision transformer. Uh, and so basically you, you feed in an image and from a certain layer, you're just going to take a vector and you're going to linearly project that one. And that's how they obtain these, these, these encodings. Uh, on the other hand, um, text encoder was GPT-2 and how they form this uh, representation. Uh, so these T1 through Tn is the following. You uh, input something called start of a sequence token, then you're gonna encode this via byte pair encoding, for example. So you're gonna embed those tokens here. And finally, you'll uh, like uh, append uh, the end of sentence token. And so uh, the, the representation they finally use is after propagating this through the transformer, they'll just take the representation that's on top of EOS token, and they're just gonna linearly project that in order to get these T1 through Tn, where n is the batch size. Um, then what they do is they L2 normalize these vectors so that they can just do dot product and uh, by doing dot product, uh, you basically just get cosine similarity. So just to recap here, so A times B, so A dot product B is actually, so L2 norm of A times L2 norm of B times cosine of theta of the angle between those two vectors, okay? And uh, since, as I said, these are normalized, so that means these are this is gonna be one. So a dot product is the same thing as cosine similarity. So you're just gonna uh, do element-wise multiplication between these embeddings and you're gonna end up with these. And finally, you're just gonna apply cross entropy, uh, like symmetric cross entropy to this matrix and that's, the, that's going to be the loss function of clip. So that will just push these terms to one and it's gonna, so these ones will be pushed to one and all of the other ones are going to be pushed down to minus one, okay? So all of the elements aside from the main diagonal are going to be pushed towards minus one. 
And that's in a nutshell how they train this multimodal embedding space. Uh, they back prop through the weights of the image encoder and the text encoder, and that's your clip. So a nice thing they uh, later showed is that they can use this in a zero shot setting on a, any target data set. So take, take for example, Cypher 10, I don't know. I think this is Cypher 10. So you have plane, car, dog, bird, whatever. And you wanna convert that gold label into this uh, format that clip is used to. And what they do is just, they do simply something like this, a photo of a, and like just insert uh, like your label for sort of a photo of a plane, I don't know. And you, you encode all of your labels into T1 through TN, uh, where N is the number of labels in your data set, so maybe like 10 for Cypher 10. And then how you classify an image, you just take your image, you encode it, and you do, again, uh, simply uh, like cosine similarity, you apply softmax, and you find the, the mode of the distribution, and that's your output. So here we have a photo of a dog. And so it's as simple as that, you can kind of, um, zero shot create this classification head and you can then classify your images and so when I said classification head uh, let me just kind of um, break that down if we take this I1 uh, embedding and I kind of uh, draw it as a, as, a, as a vector that has like maybe four dimensions let's simplify it a bit and um, so basically what these will do is they will just form the uh, weights of the connections of that classifier head. So you'll have something like this. And this will be your first output, then you'll have, uh, so this one, this embedding here, when you do multiplication with the I1 vector, you'll get something like this. So as you can see, you're just basically forming a classification head. And the reason we can do this is, as we saw here, is if we do dot product, so that's just element-wise multiplication, and that's pretty much the thing we're doing here with these connections, we do cosine similarity. And so, uh, as, as you can see, um, all of these blue, green, and other weights are formed, are pre-computed, and they form a specific classification head for this specific data set at hand. So hopefully that was clear. Now, uh, that's clip. Now let's jump into the paper. So they say here, in this work, we present an extension of the clip model that handles audio in addition to text and images. Our proposed model incorporates the ES ResNext audio model into the clip framework using the audio set data set. Such a combination enables the proposed model to perform bimodal and unimodal classification and querying while keeping CLIP's ability to generalize to unseen datasets in a zero-shot inference fashion. Uh, the main uh, unknown here, I guess, will be ES uh, ResNext, which stands for, so ES stands for environmental sound. Uh, the X part is just a modification on top of the ResNet, the famous ResNet model with skip connections. So how those sound classification models work is pretty similar. So audio is simply a 1D signal, so you'll have something like this. You'll have your samples, uh, 1D samples of your audio wave form, and that will look something like this. And you have two, pretty much two approaches uh, to audio classification. You either apply uh, something like 1D convolution and then you process this signal until you get your classification output, or you convert this, so more commonly, you just convert this into uh, like so something called spectrogram, where then you apply a 2D convolutional neural network to get your classification results. So spectrogram just has on the y-axis, you have the frequency component, on the x-axis, you have the time component, and what the spectrogram tells you is the following. So if I take a particular time point and a particular frequency, maybe like one kilohertz, it's going to tell you the amplitude of the sinusoid at that particular uh, point. And why a sinusoid? Because if you know what Fourier transform is, so you can basically represent any natural signal uh, as a sum of si sinusoids with different frequencies uh, with different amplitudes and phases. So applying that Fourier transform, you can convert this arbitrary natural signal into spectrogram. And that decomposition was just uh, proven experimentally to be super useful, so that's why we are uh, commonly using these spectrograms or male spectrograms, which are just log normalized spectrograms as, as an input. And so yeah, so yes, ResNext is just a fancy, uh, like uh, improved ResNet style architecture that uh, works across these 2D spectrograms. Uh, with a small caveat, they're not using this thing called short time uh, Fourier transform. They're using something called complex frequency B-spline uh, 
super fancy you, you don't we don't even need to know the details they just have some additional hyperparameters and what it it turns out that this stft so this short time Fourier transform is just a special case of that thing and so they can initialize it uh, so that initially it behaves as STFT but then eventually those parameters are learned and that showed to improve the results of this ES Resnex. Uh, so that's all the prerequisite knowledge you need. Again, don't worry if you don't understand every single detail here. You just have some 2D spectrogram and this ResNet model and that's how you that's how this ES Resnex works like. Okay. Now let's jump to the whole pipeline. This is how the final model uh, looks like. And as you can see, this is your standard clip. So this part here is your standard clip. And they additionally add, so this is the ES Resnext. You feed in the audio, you find the representations. And as you can see here, uh, this is like, pretty much the same idea from clip you just this time because you have the additional modality you'll create these matrices of cosine similarities between audio and image so this this one between uh, audio and text that's this one and again you have text and image that's your classical clip and that's this one and you'll basically be again maximizing the main diagonal cosine similarities you'll be suppressing the off the the main diagonal elements. And that's how you're going to train this novel audio clip model. Okay. Now, let's see what else. Um, so their, their procedure of training this thing is fairly uh, complex. There are many uh, different initializations, different uh, training procedures. So let's briefly go through the data sets they are using. Uh, and they mentioned here, so in this work, uh, the clip data set was used indirectly as a weight initializer of the text and image heads the clip model. So basically they uh, implicitly use that huge uh, OpenAI's data set by reusing their weights. That's what they want to say here. Uh, for the purposes of this work, the ImageNet data set served as a weight initializer of the ES ResNext model. So in that previous paper that introduced this model ES ResNext, they showed that using ImageNet uh, initialization helps boost the uh, classification uh, performance on sounds uh, after they additionally train it on this uh, thing called audio set which we'll soon see. So aside from those two data sets which are used implicitly they used this thing called audio set explicitly. So that's a data set that has 1.8 million so it's a fairly big data set for the for the audio uh, like uh, research community and um, so it has 527 classes whatnot and each, each sample is a snippet up to 10 seconds long from a YouTube video defined by the corresponding ID and timings. But basically, you usually ditch these part, this component, so the vision component, you just focus on the clips and on the labels of those clips. Uh, but they say here, for this work, we acquired video frames in addition to audio tracks. Uh, thus, the audio set data set became the glue between the vanilla clip framework and our tri-modal extension on top of it. Uh, during the training part, 10 equally distant frames were extracted from a video recording, and one of them was picked randomly and passed through the audio clip model. So let's see how that works. So drawing a video here, uh, something like this, I'm looking from it sideways, and these are frames, okay? And you'll have like spatial extent of the frame, whatnot, and that's not that important, okay. so. Again, uh, associated with this video, we'll have an audio. So we'll have like uh, an audio here. So that will be some like natural signal, something like this. And again, we'll have a label. So I don't know, like cat or whatnot. And um, so how they perform, how they create a data set that will be used to jointly train all of the three modalities is the following. As they mentioned, they pick randomly one of these uh, like frames, maybe this one. And so you have a 2D image there. So they are going to convert this into a 2D spectrogram. Okay, so that's again a 2D image. And you have your label here. So those three will be fed into this, this um, system and used to jointly train it. And we'll see there are a bit more details than that, but like that's that's for start. Uh, they additionally have these two data sets called Urban Sound 8K and uh, and ESC 50, which is Environment Sound Classification 50 dataset. And they use those in two ways. So uh, they mentioned here on this dataset, we perform zero shot inference using the audio clip model trained on audio set. So they use it to evaluate the models, but they also use those uh, datasets to fine tune the audio head uh, as we'll soon see. 
Aside from the data sets, they also use these data augmentations for the reason that's stated here. In comparison to the composite clip data set, uh, the audio data sets uh, provide two orders of magnitude uh, less training samples, which makes overfitting an issue. So they have this thing called time scaling, where so this is your like audio signal, and you have some like signal inside of it. And what they do is basically they either compress it. So you'll have a signal here or they decompress it. So you'll have something like this and they feed that into the uh, ES ResNex model. Uh, they also use this thing called time inversion. That's equivalent to uh, flipping your image inside computer vision tasks. So that means like simply you, you're going to, um, if we have this signal here and this is some like uh, symmetry axis, you just basically rotate by 180 to get the signal and then you feed that into ES ResNext. Um, they also have random uh, crops and padding because uh, they actually need to have these signals of uh, appropriate length so that they can be fed into this ES ResNext model. So sometimes they'll have to, if this is the, for example, if this is the uh, target uh, like length, that means they'll have to kind of pad this part here uh, they didn't say how they pad it, I guess it's zeros or something. Or if we have a longer signal, then you'll just crop it in order to fit into this, into this uh, like length of the signal. So, and yeah, finally they have this random noise. Uh, they basically just have additive uh, white Gaussian noise applied. And that's similar to when you do photometric uh, augmentations when you're training your computer vision models. So that's an equivalent type of uh, augmentation. Um, how they train this thing is the following. Um, <clears throat> while the clip model was already pre-trained on text image pairs, we decided to perform an extended audio set pre-training of the audio head first as it improved performance of the base ES ResNex model and then to continue training in a tri-model setting, combining it with two other heads. Here, the whole audio clip model was trained jointly on the audio set dataset using audio snippets, the corresponding video frames, and the assigned textual labels. The whole training pipeline roughly consists out of three parts. So the first part is you have clip and it's already pre-trained by the OpenAI team. And so that's just taken as is. Uh, the second part is your ES ResNext, which is first initialized via these ImageNet weights, and then they additionally pre train it using this audio set data set. The reason being is ImageNet weights are obviously uh, more suited towards uh, like understanding images where they want to apply this model for audio. So that's why they have this second part here. Finally, uh, and they mentioned that here. Uh, parameters of the two other sub networks, namely text and image head, were frozen during the cooperative pre training of the audio encoding head. Thus, these heads served as teachers in a multimodal knowledge distillation setup. So, that means the third component is again, they're training on, e on this uh, audio set data set, but they this time do it jointly. So, here they had a standalone training of ES ResNext. Here they're doing jointly. So, when I say jointly, let me just go back here to the do that drawing. Okay, so what I do is they freeze these. So they freeze these weights here, they freeze these weights here. And now they just back prop through this model. Uh, and they jointly train this whole system, but they just uh, update the weights of the audio head. So that's the third part of how they train the ES next. So as I said, multiple, multiple details there. Um, but yeah, and the last part is they actually train the whole system jointly and they update all of the three models as they mentioned here Here all three modality dedicated heads were tuned together making the resulting model take into account the distribution of images and textual descriptions in addition to the distribution of audio samples uh, So the reason they do this is because clip was obviously trained on this uh, OpenAI data set and here they want to evaluate this audio clip model on audio set. And so that's the reason why they additionally uh, fine tune all of the three heads onto audio set uh, because that kind of boosts the performance on the downstream tasks. And um, it makes sense, I guess. Okay, finally, let's see the results. Um, first things first, they, they kind of showed that uh, the original uh, pre-training on audio da data set of this ES ResNex model uh, so when they have like m more epochs, the, the, the performance gets better on the audio set and it marginally gets better on these two other data sets. So that's kind of um, not that informative. Let's, let's see some other tables they have here. So this is an important one. 
So we evaluate audio clip in two settings. First is audio head only, and then the full model. So audio head only is that when you only train the audio head while the two one, the other two, the text and the image uh, heads were frozen. And the full model is where you jointly train all of the three heads. And we can see on ImageNet, the performance actually goes down which makes sense if you think about it because the ES Resnex was pre was, uh, was initialized with image net weights and the more you find fine tune it jointly with the other heads the less the, the more the the model forgets those initial image net weights and the worse its performance gets on the image net uh, data set and again uh, hopefully you understand the setup here so let me just go, kind of go back here uh, so what happens here is you have this setup you, you take your image and data sets, you'll have thousand labels, you'll encode them into these thousand embeddings, and then how you um, find the accuracy, you just take image net images and you feed them and you apply this process to find the, the highest cosine similarity. That's how you're going to do the classification on image net. Um, let's get back to the, to the table. Uh, they also show results on audio set. Here we can have we can classify images, we can also just embed audio uh, using ES Resnext instead of uh, image. And again, um, they show here that obviously the performance gets better, which makes sense since they are training jointly on this very same audio set data set. They additionally report state-of-the-art results on this Urban Sound 8K and ESC50 data sets in the full model setup, which is, which is cool. Um, not much new information here. They again have like, th these are the st state of the art results and they report this uh, zero shot. I kind of ha hate these tables. Uh, I'd love if th they had some lines here, but yeah. So the, this row here shows you the, the zero shot performance of the audio clip. And here in this row, they actually pre-train on these data sets and that's where they get the soda results, okay? Uh, the last thing where they report the results are on querying. And basically, because we now have three modalities, that means you can query in multiple ways. You can query uh, with an image, you can query audio, or, or, or you can qu query via text, you can query images, or via images, you can query audio. Or so, so all of the different directions are possible, and they test all of those. And again, uh, let, let's see the results. So if, we, if, if you query with text uh, for images on ImageNet, the performance actually drops if we go to the uh, jointly trained model, which again makes sense, um, that's consistent with the previous results from the previous table. But again, uh, on the audio set, they actually do improve uh, on all of these different uh, like uh, combinations. So uh, querying with text where the result is an image, querying with text where the result is audio, they also query with audio where the result is image and vice versa. And again, they have some small regression here on the ESC50. So basically, the only the, so the only data set where they have improvements, but it's a big one, is this audio set. Uh, and all of the other results are either regress or stay uh, pretty much the same as prior to this uh, joint training. So these querying capabilities are super important because that's how we search for information. So if you think about Google, you basically have a textual query and you retrieve bunch of different information that can be of various modalities. So it can be an image, it can be a video, it can be text, whatever. So Google used to be rule-based system. And in the meanwhile, like a couple of years ago when BERT Transformer was uh, was published, uh, Google started uh, using BERT in production. So when you type something in, in Google, you have uh, neural networks uh, being used to retrieve certain uh, like results of your queries. And that's something called neural search. And when, when I'm at it, uh, let me just mention uh, Gina AI, which is an open source framework, which is super cool because uh, compared to Google, which is a general purpose framework, which you obviously cannot integrate into your own projects, you can use Gina AI to, uh, to kind of integrate this search functionality into your project where they're using neural search. And as, as soon as models such as audio clip are kind of published, uh, Gene AI developers integrate all of those novel research into their framework and it, they make it easy to extend uh, their framework uh, with these novel models. So do check them out. I'm a huge fan of open source. Uh, if, if you've been following my, my channel for quite some time, you know that I'm, I'm bullish on open source. You can check out some of my previous projects on GitHub. Uh, if you're into that, I have a bunch of different deep learning uh, projects implemented there from scratch. So do check those projects out, do check Gina AI, and until next time, subscribe, share out this video if you liked it, and bye bye.